Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to AM Impact on Your Health. AM Impact on Your Health is heard each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney with you today and a special version of our show, special because, well, it's a pre-recorded version and sort of had to be that way. Our guest is so special, he's spending time with us. He's actually speaking to us from the Kona coast of Hawaii. He travels worldwide, but he offers a therapy that you're all going to be very intrigued with, one you know a little bit about, but you're going to learn so much more from our guest today. His name is Dr. Ty Vincent. He originally hails from Wasilla, Alaska. He happens to be in his southern exposure right now, a Kona Coast exposure. Uh, and uh, we're recording this today so that we can play this live for you at another time. Uh, I want to say good morning and welcome, Dr. Ty Vincent, to our airways, and, uh, and permit and allow me to, uh, to impinge upon his time so early in, in the morning in Hawaii. Good morning, Dr. Ty. Good morning, Dr. Dennis. Thank you very much. Courtney? Well, uh, Ty, uh, we've been trying to arrange for this for quite some time, and um, we saw each other, uh, well, initially two years ago, and then we just have been recently together out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for an exciting conference where you pretty much brought the place down with your approaches to treating immunological problems. We hope to be able to get into what it is that uh, you do and how you do it, and what differences that may be for how this treatment known as LBA uh, is uh, now being expanded. But before we get into that level of expertise, I thought maybe we could just start generally with Dr. Ty Vincent himself and give our listeners a bit of your background and how you have arisen to the point in uh, your medical practice and career that you have today and what steps you've gone through to get there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> anything specific you want me to start with, or should I start from uh, where you? Well, where are you from? Where, where did you where did you grow up? <clears throat> I, uh, I was actually born in Anchorage, Alaska, but uh, within my age two, my parents had moved us out to uh, Wasilla, the town I, I still live in, half-time which was only maybe uh, 1,500 to 2,000 people back in the early 70s. And uh, it's it's grown to over 20,000 since then. I've seen it change quite a bit. But it was a typical small-town USA with just a couple of local family docs that still made house calls, and I still have traumatic childhood memories of them coming in the night and giving me penicillin shots in my butt. Uh, <laughs> so then I, I stayed there until college, and... Uh, Ended up going out of state for a couple of years and then, then back up to finish in Anchorage itself. And uh, sometime through my college career, I, I decided to go ahead and uh, think about applying to medical school. Uh, but I didn't have any medical experience. I had worked in restaurants for years and taken care of uh, myself and my wife and uh, two kids I had by the time I started medical school, actually. So I was, I was one of your more non-traditional students. I didn't just go sure. right through. I had a family, and I had worked two jobs and put myself through school, so I had a lot more life experience than your average uh, medical student, it seemed like at the time. And I uh, I got into medical school at the University of Washington, which enabled me to do a lot of my training still in Alaska around family support. That was very important to me. It was also one of the better medical schools in the country. Um, I think one of the things that has helped me do uh, do things differently and keep an open mind was was that I I never really did think about being a doctor until just before you know finishing college and applying to medical school I wasn't one of those long lifelong dreamers about being in medicine <clears throat> it just seemed like a decent career path and I felt like I was a fairly smart guy and I could probably get into medical school <laughs> and uh-huh. that was about all the thought I gave it so. The first time I applied to medical school, they actually turned me down. Even though my scores and grades were were stellar, it was pretty clear at the interview that I had no idea why I wanted to be a doctor. And then it turns out that they they like people to have some idea as to why they want to be a doctor. So uh, I took that rejection, and I became a certified nurse's assistant. And I, I worked for a year and a half hands-on with patients in a hospital setting in Anchorage at Providence Hospital. 
and gained a lot of medical experience from, you know, what we would consider the front line, that dealing with patients themselves and talking to their families. And that experience, I think, was invaluable in me uh, getting through medical training um, better than a lot of my peers, actually. I had a different perspective, and I had a, a more hands-on healing sort of attitude. Uh, before medical school, I also was reading books by Andrew Weil and some other things about natural medicine and nutrition, and I, and I foolishly thought that in medical school, that's what I was going to be learning about, was how the body worked and how to actually promote health uh, with the human body. And then, of course, any of us who have gone through conventional medical training and not, aren't naturopaths know that in conventional MD and DO training, that's not at all what they teach you. You know, as I went through medical school, um, it was pretty much just drug-based and how to, you know, deteriorate somebody's symptoms with some sort of chemical. Sure. Um, and and it, was, it was pretty disappointing. <clears throat> and as I, since I had the pre-existing attitude towards natural sorts of medicine, and I never really cared about the white coat or the black stethoscope or the prestige or the title of being a doctor. I, I kind of always had the attitude that if what they were teaching me didn't make sense, I was at liberty to figure things out on my own. Uh, and I've always held that attitude through as, as, the, as I've gone through medicine now, practicing out of training for 10 years now. And, and that, that's part of what we'll get to later when we talk about my attitude about all the rules that have been imposed on us for LDA over the years. I, I, I'm just not very accepting of other people's rules until I can prove or disprove them for myself. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, uh, I, I ended up finishing medical school, had a third child during that time, and then went to residency back in Anchorage, um, family practice residency. So learned how to do colonoscopies, deliver babies, manage my own intensive care unit patients, the, the usual conventional medical paradigm. Um, but once we got to conventional or to the clinical training, rather, it became really obvious to me that all of my, my uh, chronically ill patients don't ever get better if you just manage them with the proper pharmaceutical prescriptions that we're all taught to do. They basically just stay sick and gradually deteriorate and develop new problems, sometimes as a direct result of what you're giving them. And so by, the, by my third year, I had started reading a lot of nutritional medicine um, information and some alternative things. I actually got an opportunity to learn acupuncture during my third year of residency. So on top of being chief resident and a third year resident and having three kids at home, I also did the uh, Helms Medical Institute medical acupuncture training as a third year resident. And then I did the module on uh, Chinese herbal medicine. And so I picked up some extra skills right there that, opened my mind to the fact that what I had been taught so far was incredibly narrow and that there was a lot more out there. <clears throat> and uh, over the years, I've just I've connected with multiple other integrative medicine teaching organizations like the Institute for Functional Medicine, uh, the uh, American Academy, or the American College for Advanced in Medicine, rather, ACAM. And, I, and early on, I found the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, which put on the meeting you and I met at in Albuquerque right. last month. Or sorry, in October. And uh, I actually was so stricken by the information they were teaching at AEM. And I, I approached the, the secretary, I think, at lunchtime the first day and said, how come I've never heard of these guys? They're, they're, they're teaching people things that everyone should know. It's really, it's all mostly immune system based. And when you think about it, an incredible amount of what we see in chronic disease in the U.S. today is immune system-based. And conventional medicine has nothing of value to offer it, really, besides symptomatic control. So I kind of shot my mouth off at lunchtime there to the, <laughs> the wrong people, apparently, because they, they got me stuck on the board. And uh, <laughs> if, I, if I would serve on the board, they didn't have a lot of young people on the board at the time I was still young. And uh, so I spent four years on the board of that organization, um, and on three different boards at one point in time nationally until I've, I've managed to weed that out of my my life because I don't have the free time. <laughs> but uh, that, that was very helpful, being involved in AEM for so long. And a lot of my more effective methods in my clinical practice have come from that organization, that particularly LDA. I really bonded with 
the low dose allergen therapy so oh, about seven years ago now when I first learned it and it's become a mainstay in my practice and, and that's, that's kind of what we're talking about today is that what I've done to is. adapt that treatment. Well that um that was and I just let you go because I, I was fascinated to hear to see the step that you went through and how you evolved and I think our listeners can really appreciate where you started and where you've arrived now and um switching gears just a bit and sort of uh, picking up where you just left off, uh, AAEM exposed you to treatments that you'd never heard of before, and a number of those treatments uh, were immunologically based. It was then a natural, as I'm listening to you, that a topic of a treatment called LDA would be alluring to you enough that you wanted to learn more. And so if I could... I'd like to ask you about, you say seven years ago you were exposed to LDA. Uh, We know LDA stands for low-dose antigen, and uh, the gentleman who we've looked to for so long for the guidance on this is what we'll call him the godfather of LDA. His name is Dr. William Butch Schrader. Take us back to that earliest time when you first worked with LDA, and tell us about your initial experiences and how it either solved or confunded uh, what you were working with, with the patients you used to treat. Right. Well, before I before I, I went to the first workshop about LDA, I had attended the sublingual immunotherapy workshop and some of the other standard ones. So I was I was already familiar with provocation neutralization techniques, and I was doing um, sublingual immunotherapy or SLIT in my practice, uh, which required lots of testing, you know, skin testing with all sorts of different antigens and and then titrating to the proper starting treatment dose. It was a multi-step process that required a whole refrigerator full of antigens and lots of time and lots of money invested for the patient. And then they had to use therapy on a daily basis and they had to keep adjusting their dose and I had to continue making different drops for people. And it was very labor intensive. And then these are some of the the mainstays of environmental medicine that have been taught for, for decades in the U.S. And, but, so I, I, was, I was working with those therapies at the time. And when I attended the LDA workshop, it was, it was so much simpler, and it made so much sense to me. You know, the mechanism is very elegant, and it's a means of globally reestablishing tolerance for so many antigens at once. It, to me, it, it just like a, a bulb went off in my head and was like, this, this is really the way we should be approaching certain, you know, our, our patients with allergies, not this other stuff that's so so labor-intensive and archaic. I mean, to me, it was like the difference between driving a horse and buggy versus having a sports car. It was just so much faster and simpler. <laughs> so I had... You know, sometimes when you're sitting through a new a new lecture or you're learning new material, you have particular patients pop up in your head as, to, oh, my God, this would work for so-and-so. You know, this person I've struggled to treat for a year or two or sometimes 10 years, and you think, I'm going to take this home and I'm going to treat that one person. So I had a, uh, a person in mind for LDA, absolutely. He was like an eight- or nine-year-old boy who had the worst case of eczema you ever saw. It looked like he'd been set on fire from head to toe. Mm. Couldn't even grow hair in on his head because his eczema was so bad on his scalp. And he also had asthma, sent him to the ER repeatedly, and chronic sinusitis. And I like that. And I know this kid got horrible food allergies and inhalant allergies, so he was the one I had in my mind when I was learning about LDA. And I thought, I'm going to buy this LDA kit and, and start this therapy, even if it's just to treat that one kid. And I took it home, and I talked to them, and he didn't want to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was like, all right, well, I started, I started you know, offering it to everybody else that I saw that had allergies and bringing it up. And, and at the time, as you know, I, I, was, I was told all these rules that Dr. Schrader has handed down from the original guy who, who developed treatment, Lynn McEwen in the UK, all these rules have been handed down like dogma over the generations. And I was telling people they had to eat this restrictive diet and they had to avoid this and that and couldn't take their supplements and medications. And so as you and many other LDA practitioners, I'm sure, experience, people refuse to do it. They're like, it's too complicated. They're just not sick enough to be able to, to, to make it worth their while to follow all those rules. 
but I did have enough people start doing the therapy um, that I pretty quickly stopped doing all the other forms of allergy treatment that I'd been doing. I didn't do provocation neutralization anymore. I didn't do sublingual immunotherapy anymore. It just so easily replaced all of that stuff for me because it's, it's so much simpler. And was it as effective as you uh, had hoped? In other words, from the patients that you treated, um, what percentage of the time do you think you hit the home run and really knocked it out of the ballpark? You know, I, I think that there's great response for people two-thirds of the time easily. I think there's good response for people uh, another you know, 10 to 15 percent of the time, and there's you know, modest improvement for people another percentage of the time, enough to where they're willing to continue therapy, but they're not really cured, you know, you wouldn't say. And I would bet overall, easily more than 90% of my patients we treat with LDA have a good enough response to where it's, it's, it's worth them continuing. I guess if you can use that as a criterion, mm-hmm. um, it's worth their continuing, coming to the office every couple of months and, you know, getting this, this dose of allergens and they minimize their medication usage for their allergies or, you know, some other effect. But I would say for about two-thirds, it, it, it's essentially curative. I mean, they don't need symptomatic meds anymore for their allergies or autoimmune diseases or whatever. Um, and then you get, you get a partial response for another 25% or so. so it's, it's been extremely useful. I, I mean, as you know, I'm very passionate about it. Anybody who hears me start talking about it at a national meeting kind of suddenly gets reinvigorated about the whole thing because I, I think it's just so amazing. It comes through when I talk about it. Well, you know, um, you're talking about numbers, and I, I agree. I think I've uh, seen some very similar numbers. I, I would imagine most of the docs who do LDA have seen similar numbers. Uh, we're very content, and then we get frustrated whenever, because we, we think this should work for everybody, um, but Levels of frustration in some doctors produce certain responses, but in Ty Vincent, it looked like it took on a whole new uh, aspect that others have never gone. And so it must have really bugged you that those percentages, small as they were be, of people who couldn't respond, um, you didn't give up. And you went after trying to fix the ones that didn't get better. And i got to commend you for that but it started you on a path that uh, allowed you to do some experimentation. I'd love you to share um, that, that part of you that obviously got upset from not being able to help others, and then what steps you took to try to get it rectified, because I know you've been working for the 100% and not the 60%. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't think anything short of 100% is, is really satisfactory. And that's, or I had a, I had a lot of patients ask me over the years, you know, why I, why, and practitioners ask me why I came to have all these different skill sets. Because I went through training in, like I said, acupuncture and herbal medicine. I, I uh, became a master level Reiki practitioner. I learned environmental medicine and hormone replacement therapy and chelation and all this stuff, like a lot of our integrative colleagues learn as well. And after I got asked that question enough times, I finally realized that, that the answer was I don't do well with failure. Um, you know, some people are content to just look at their successes and, and blow off their failures, and I'm not, I'm not for some reason. And you're right, is these, some of these people that stayed sick despite what I was doing, I, I've always taken it upon myself to figure out what else I can do. You know, a lot of in, our conventional colleagues we're trained to just blame the patient. You know, if things don't work right, it's the patient's fault. But I, you don't really make progress that way. So I always just figured there's something I got to learn. There's something else that I can come up with or learn. And it has worked out very well for me. And patients that I've struggled with for some time, you know, I've just told them, hey, you know what? Come back in six months <laughs> because I will have some new idea for you and by then. So six tired. months to a year. I will uh, have something that will work. Just just stick with me. Touch base every once in a while. Well, and, I want and that my has listeners proven to be, to be true for almost all of them now. I don't have very many failures left on my, my bucket list at work. You know, we all have those patients that we feel like, I can't retire until I figure out what to do for this lady. 
Um, and I don't have very many of them left now. But I, uh, I, I, one of the things I found about LDA in general that I mentioned at my lectures is that you need to get people's vitamin D level up real high for LDA to work well. And I think one of the key things that boosted my success rate with this form of immunotherapy across the board is I, I push people's vitamin D levels up to where their blood levels are somewhere like 120 and 150 is what I shoot for. And that's above the reference range for most labs. So a lot of practitioners are nervous to get them there. But there are plenty of labs out there who have a reference range that goes up to 150, and it's completely safe to do that. So, I, I, you know, 10,000 units a day or something north of there for certain patients, and that dramatically improves your success rate, it turns out. But aside from that, I, I started to realize that because of the way LDA works, which is a global retraining of tolerance to the immune system, I mean, I, I refer to it as more of a tolerance promoter then as a desensitizing treatment. We're used to the concept of desensitization with traditional hay fever shots and whatnot, and they don't really change the underlying immune process much, but what they do is they kind of squelch the symptoms in a very aggressive and, and dangerous manner. But with LDA, because of the enzyme-potentiated effect on, the, on your lymphocytes, I'm sorry if that's too technical for some of the listeners, but what, what you're doing and I just came up with this analogy the other day, actually, is you're, you're sending a friend request to your immune system, like on Facebook, like, hey, you want to be friends? Uh, instead, of, instead of demanding or being aggressive about it, it, it's, hey, we're friendly. Everything in this mixture is, is not to be attacked any longer. And you can, you can do that with literally thousands of antigens at the same time, and your immune system can process all of that information. It's profound. I mean, if you give the person from standard LDA, you give them the food mixture, the environmental inhalant mixture, and the chemical mixture all together, which I do all the time, they're doing more than a thousand different specific antigens, and their immune system processes it fine. So as I, I, re I started to think about the mechanism of what was going on, I started to think about what other things you could use that same mechanism for. And then it, it's an obvious transition, or it seemed to me, to think about autoimmune disease. And we already know Dr. Schrader has, has offered um, certain specific bacteria to treat certain autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis and some others. And when the specific bacterial trigger is understood for a condition, you can neutralize people or, or promote tolerance to that bacterium, and their autoimmune disease gets better. Well, there's already a precedent for treating autoimmune diseases with this therapy using specifically known organisms. All right. Can you but, do this for me, Dr. D Dr. Ty? Um, huh? i got a f feeling, is there may be some listeners right now aren't familiar with LDA. I'm right. right on your page. A lot of my listeners are also, too. Could you take a moment, however, thinking of those who may just be tuning us and us up for the first time, what, when you're asked, is LDA and how is it accomplished, how do you answer that question? Because there may be a few listeners right now that absolutely are confused by, sure. by what we're doing. So how do you answer the question? Uh, you know, what I tell them, I guess the simpler way to understand it is, I start by explaining the ways in which the immune system can malfunction, okay? So, and I broke this out in my lecture in Albuquerque. The immune system pays attention to both um, tolerance, which is an actively learned concept, it's not passive, and defense. And it, it does these two actions within two different realms, the outside world and the inside world, okay? <laughs> so if, if, if those things fail in different four little categories you end up with. Defense against the external world, if that fails, you get an infection, okay? If failure of defense against the internal environment occurs, you get cancer because cancer is something your immune system is supposed to be fending off internally. Those are defense issues. And on the tolerance side of things, if your immune system fails to tolerate the outside environment, you get allergies. You get hay fever, you get dog allergy, cat allergy, you get mold allergy, you get food and peanut allergies, chemical allergies. So that's a failure 
of programmed immune tolerance to the external environment. If you have a failure of programmed immune tolerance to the internal environment, which is the grandest failure of all, in my opinion, of the immune system, you get an autoimmune disease. You get a condition where your body's immune system is attacking yourself in some specific way. And so what LDA does is it reestablishes tolerance in a very active manner to whatever antigens you're including in the mixture. So if you have environmental allergies like hay fever or a cat or dog or mold allergy or something like that, or all of the above in many of our patients' cases, you use a mixture that we get from the pharmacy of 300 different environmental proteins or allergens, and you you include this little enzyme. The enzyme beta-glucuronidase is the key to the whole thing working which is why I actually like the original term enzyme potentiated desensitization better than I like LDA, but it had to be changed in the U.S. Anyway, so what you're doing really in an active way is reestablishing immune tolerance to hundreds of things at once, depending on the category of allergen the person has or the internal item the person's reacting to. And so in a conceptual way, it's all about tolerance. It's all about reteaching tolerance to the immune system. And we can do that for any antigen we want, as long as we can get a sample of it. And, you know, even when I, when I talk to practitioners about LDA, they're so familiar with the idea of desensitization and, and turning down immune responses or flooding them or something with traditional kinds of therapies. They don't realize that tolerance is really a very different concept than that. And immune tolerance is critical to normal function of the human being. And first, before you're even born, your immune system has to learn to tolerate your own tissue and your own self. Like before a baby even comes into the world, their lymphocytes have, re have learned to recognize what all of their own proteins look like. And then once they're born, Oh my God, you get exposed to all the bacteria and yeast and flora through the birth canal. You get exposed to all the things that are in the air, you know, plant pollens and, and, you know, human dander and everything else, dust mites. And your immune system immediately has to process all this information and decide that everything it's experiencing must be normal. And it's an active learned process of tolerance. So anyway, as allergy develops later on, that's a failure of that learned tolerance. And what we're doing is just reteaching that tolerance back to the immune system. And um, in terms of how that's accomplished, um, uh, a series of injections are given, and uh, they're usually spaced out in, in between them. And over a certain period of time, the LDA approach is really able to guide you to the point where you shouldn't need the injections or the treatment anymore. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's true in a certain percentage of people. Um, and if you look at the long-term literature like Butch, Butch Schrader has and some others, I, I think he reports about a third of patients can just completely stop therapy altogether, uh, altogether at some point after a few years of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, other people will have to continue doing um, doses of antigens on some spaced out infrequent basis, like maybe once a year or maybe once every six months. So it becomes becomes a very infrequent, very user-friendly thing, but I don't tell people to expect that they will be done someday, because even though it's true for some people, but, you know, people, it's really important what kind of expectations to give people, um, and I prefer to give them a slightly lower expectation, because then if they exceed that, they're happy, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, look, I'm done. I don't have to do therapy anymore. We, we've treated some children with really severe allergies where we gave them just one or two doses, and they've never had to come back for another. And that's the truth. Now, yeah. but then others have to keep coming back every two months for years on end, and then you don't know how to predict who's who. Okay, that's a fair enough answer. Now, you said something earlier on in our conversation, and I just got to come back to because... Um, you're such the maverick uh, because we've all followed these rules, these Dr. Schrader rules, so religiously that it was almost uh, like her heretical to think that one wouldn't follow them. But you've been known as a rule buster your whole life because it seems like if there was ever a rule that was written, you'd figure out a way 
not to have to obey the rule. Is there something about time distance that just doesn't work well with rules? Well, I'm not. I don't have a problem with authority so much as I have a very um, a very high requirement for proof in, for me. So for you, I, I, I did a lot of <laughs> my, a lot of my college education was in the field of philosophy and logic. And and so that has made me get easily annoyed when people have an absolute rule that is not absolutely true. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I always take it upon myself to challenge rules and, and see which ones are valid and which ones are not, sort of in life, you know, within within the constraints of safety and, and reason. But that's, of course, my own sense of safety and reason, which my wife would probably say isn't normal either. Um and I, I, I think with LDA, you know, I followed the rules strictly for the first year or so, maybe two years. And then I think what really helped me personally start breaking free of the rules with LDA specifically um, was some of my patients confessed to me after having done two or three doses that they weren't actually following the rules. Ah. Now, I would tell them, read the book, follow all these rules. And some would come back and say, you know what, I, I haven't been following that diet, and I continued my supplements and this and that, and it's working for me great. And so, you know, that's one of the things to me is like, all right, there's this rule that we're all taught is important, uh, is a mandatory rule. But if you give me one exception to that rule, then it's no longer a rule. It's a guideline. I see. And I, make, I make a distinction there between a guideline, a starting point, and a hard and fast rule. And so when I had some patients start to tell me, hey, I'm doing fantastically with this therapy, even though I'm not following all these rules, I pretty quickly stopped telling people to follow the rules. And I thought, okay, look, because your, your experience, I'm sure, with this and many practitioners was that so many patients wouldn't even try it because the rules were so That's overwhelming. Right. But my thought was, you know what, I just won't tell people to follow the rules, and if they have two or three doses and it does not seem to be working, then I will tell them about the rules. Because those will be the mandatory rule followers, and they are out there. I would say only about 10% of my 10%? patients have to follow the rules. How about allowing me this pleasure? Because um, I'm going to go down tick through a list. Uh, there, There's steadfast Dr. Schrader rules Patients of mine know about these rules. People that are listening to me right now didn't do LDA because they didn't like the rules. I'm going to tick through a bunch of these topics and let you just take it, okay? Okay. Let's take this first rule about, um, let's take the diet. Very stringent diet that Dr. Schrader puts you on about what you're allowed to eat and how you're allowed to eat it. How do you instruct your patients on diet? Or don't you instruct them at all? We know if they have... Food, if they have food allergy, I tell them that they will probably do better if they avoid the foods that they're allergic to. And I just leave it at that. So like, just don't eat the foods you know you're allergic to for about two weeks after the shot. Um, but I don't give them any other restriction besides that because it, it doesn't seem relevant. You know, the, the list of foods they're allowed to eat in the LDA rules include, um, like, sweet potatoes and cooked carrots and certain things. And, and I've had patients that are allergic to those items. So, you know, it, 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 the diet doesn't make sense to me in a lot of ways. And I don't want to belabor that point much, but it started to just, I started to think, you know what, this can't really be true for people in general. And uh, I've, I've found that as long as folks don't eat the things that they already know make them sick, they generally do just fine. That's and, all and that's, you have to say. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's and I love hearing it from you. What about supplementation? Always big rules about you can't take supplements. Um, is that true, or has that worked out to be another one of these things that uh, doesn't appear to matter? No, I don't think that matters at all. I haven't really run into a supplement or a medication, for that matter, that really seems to interfere with LDA with any kind of consistency. I know vi vitamin C is on the list, for example, of something you shouldn't take for a week or so after the shot. We have patients that come in for a vitamin C IV, and we'll give them 25 grams of vitamin C, and we give them their LDA shot the same day, and it works fine. Oh, I That's love right. this. It I just doesn't it. seem to be valid for most of my patients. But again, maybe part of that is because I have them on so much vitamin D. 
I mean, it might override some of these other things that would have been a factor otherwise. And what's your standard dose, just for the heck of it, for vitamin D? What are you putting these patients on? If uh, anybody weighs more than 100 pounds, I have them take 10,000 units a day. I like to check their blood level after they're on it for a couple of months and see if it needs to be adjusted from there because everybody's a little different. And for children, I have them take 1,000 units per day for every 10 pounds of body weight. So if it's a you know, 50-pound kid, I have them take 5,000 units a day and so forth. And as they grow, that gets adjusted upward until they get north of 100 pounds, and then they stop at 10,000 a day. That seems to work out pretty well. Perfect. Um, the dosing frequency, um, we got a seven- to eight-week rule. You follow that rule, don't you? Yes, that is the only rule that I actually follow. <laughs> the <laughs> only rule that is honestly true, hard and fast rule, and you cannot break that, meaning you cannot give them another dose of the same antigen sooner than seven weeks. There's a hard ceiling on that. You can give them a different antigen, though. So if you give somebody the food antigen today, uh, they can come back in a week or 10 days, and you can give them the chemical mixture, or you can give them the mixture I made for Lyme disease or for some other thing. Okay. Now... Um, how about preps? We have um, exhaustive descriptions of uh, triple regime, antibiotic, antifungal, and probiotic. Uh, religiously, these are followed uh, with certain diseases. Do you also feel that those kinds of strict preps prior to injections are necessary? No, I don't. I don't actually follow any of those. But the one. <laughs> The one, and I never have, honestly, um, the one thing I do actually think is helpful, though, is with people who have a lot of yeast overgrowth. You know, if they've got excessive candida or uh, other forms of yeast overgrowth, I do like to give them fluconazole or some antifungal regimen for about a week beforehand because having, having that big burden of yeast is such an immune um, adjutant. I guess, or uh, such an, uh, an immune distractor that they don't respond as well to the LDA. Even if, this is especially true when I'm desensitizing them to yeast specifically, which is something I started doing about six years ago. Um, and that's magical for people with yeast sensitivity. If, if they, ha if I can get their yeast load down a bit, you know, for like a week ahead of time, they do better. But for all the autoimmune diseases where you're using bacterial antigens, I've never given antibiotics or any kind of prep. Ne clear you've never given, you've uh, never me, given you, those antibiotics. You can't even do that. Never given the antibiotics. I hear you're right. No, never. Not once. Uh, the, this is, uh, my, my listeners and my patients are beginning to love you more and more with each each passing <laughs> question. Um, I, think it's easier, pretty yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty much as safe to say you follow no rules except for the seven to eight week rule between injections. How about this one, though? because I thought uh, you passed this one off a very nice way in Albuquerque. If you in, inject uh, intradermally uh, an antigen or groups of antigens and nothing happens, okay, uh, to you that's the worst sign possible. To go with nothing happens, everything happens, or little things happen. That's a great rule that I think my listeners will love to hear from you. Uh, you mean at the injection site? Yeah, well, when, once you give an injection, uh, one would always hope to think that their patients would like to hear them uh, say they're feeling better, and uh, that's certainly music to our ears. But actually what we learned from you was it's not just if you feel better. You actually smile if they feel worse. You want to get into some of that? Right. Yeah, and that, that's mostly true for all the, the customized things that I've made or the autologous mixtures that I make because, you know, if, if when I'm experimenting, and, and this one we didn't really talk about yet, that divergence from the standard mixtures, I started using mixtures I made from the patient's own bodily fluids or bodily substances, and I, I made my own mixture of yeast organisms, for example, just ordered my own antigens and made my own mixtures. But when you do those customized things, you don't know what the right treatment dose is because everyone's a little different. I mean, for the standard antigens, the treatment doses have been very well worked out, and for most people, they all get the same dose. 
But with these customized things I've made, I have to guess. And sometimes I'm guessing at what the trigger even is for a person. For example, the Lyme disease mixture I put together is 16 different bacteria that are involved in Lyme disease and co-infection. That's my original mixture. I'm actually remaking that mixture this month, and it's going to have more like 50 different bacteria um, and be more all-encompassing. But I have to give someone a dose of this at some dilution and then see how they respond. And... I use it as a diagnostic tool. Like so many of our patients with Lyme disease, I'm just using this as an example because it's a good one. So many of our patients with Lyme disease have inconclusive testing and they're not even certain of their diagnosis. So if I give them a fairly strong dilution of the Lyme disease mixture and they have a symptom flare, their joints hurt or their fatigue gets worse or their neurological symptoms get exacerbated or something, then the good news is we know their diagnosis. You know, I do get excited about that. I'm like, yes, I got the right answer. I have the right trigger. Um, And that's good news because I know that all we have to do is dilute it further and find the right dose, and it will make them better. And this is where LDA follows some of the rules of homeopathy in that anything that makes you sick, we can use to make you well again in manipulating the immune system. It's all just a matter of dosage. Now, we're going to ultimately get to talking about your customized mixtures and autologous antigens. Um, We're going to try to wrap up this. Like, let's just say this. Uh, LDA is what we've recognized this treatment is for the longest time, but you tend to use a different moniker, and I'm going to let you... Ty Vincent, tell us why you prefer and why you think it's better to use something called LDI to describe what we do. Take it away. Well, I think, you know, low, LDA stands for low-dose allergy therapy. So when you're treating allergies and you're using the standardized mixtures for inhaled food and chemical allergens that come from college pharmacy, I still refer to those as LDA antigens because that is sort of a trademark term and it says it on the label of the antigens that I get. But everything that I make, I make mixtures for yeast, I make mixtures for um, Lyme disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. I have mixtures of other random fungi and bacteria. I even have a dilution of insulin that I use for a type 1 diabetic with insulin antibodies. And all the things that I make from patients' own bodily fluids themselves, which I've done about 100 times now, I refer to all of that other stuff as low-dose immunotherapy, because none of it's actually allergy. And I think it's an important distinction. Um, One is just to separate all the the stuff that I made and not infringe on uh, college pharmacy's terminology for what they call their antigens. And the other is just my own sense of logic and, and reality in that I'm not treating allergy. All of these things I'm treating are basically autoimmunity of one form or another. So I think low-dose immunotherapy is, is a better broad term for what we're doing because it describes what's going on. We are manipulating the immune system by using very low doses of antigen. And the doses are usually diluted one to, one to a trillion or even further. And I think anybody would agree that those are low, low doses, that number. And probably should be mentioned the same breath extremely safe because it's such a low dose. Correct. I would say, though, like the patients I have with Lyme disease, um, when we give them a dose that's too strong, as, you know, our first guess, if it's too strong, I've had some have really pretty terrible flares for up to a month. And, you know, they would say, oh, you made me sicker. I'm like, well, yeah, but it's temporary. It's just like they had a flare of their disease and and begin with because you've accentuated the immune response. Um, And so I do have to warn people that have very inflammatory diseases that if I give them a dose that's too strong, just incidentally, that they will experience a flare. But like we said before, it's good news for the future, and it just means we need to leave a lower dose, and they usually calm down with prednisone for a week or two. Um, But I do have to caution people about those. With the standard allergy therapies, though, that they make at college, there's never been a case of anaphylactic shock or some other severe reaction. 
uh, by using those antigens. They're, they're even being used in this country for 24 years now or so and used in the UK for 30 years before that. Never a documented case of a severe reaction to these shots. So, yes, they're very safe. And uh, would it be safe to say so that we can sort of branch out as we're coming to a conclusion of this show and setting up the stage for the next show, when it comes to the traditional conventional allergies of inhaled foods and chemicals, the LDA concept has really been a winner and more than likely very high percentage of corrections, uh, sometimes even leading to complete resolution of the problem. And um, and you found that in your experience, and I've certainly found that in mine. Um, uh, and you you would you would agree that that that's exactly correct, would you? Yeah, okay. absolutely. The okay. only exceptions I've I've seen, and you may you may let me know if you've seen this too, are gluten allergy. A lot of people who have pretty significant sensitivity to gluten do not lose that sensitivity through the use of LDA. It's special somehow. Um, I've had some people with really severe dairy allergy not recover their ability to consume dairy either. Those two are just very inflammatory. <clears throat> and then uh, people who have developed very esoteric or uncommon chemical sensitivities don't necessarily get covered by the uh, main chemical mixture. But if you can get a sample of whatever chemical they react to, you can make your own and desensitize them to whatever they are specifically sensitive to. So the technique still works. And you just, it's just one of those areas where I didn't accept failure once again. <laughs> okay. So give, me a, give me a sample of what you know makes you sick, and I, I can use it to make you better. Perfect place to go to next that uh, really is the line of demarcation from LDA to LDI. The Ty Vincent world is the LDI world. And um, you went there, and that was that thing about you that said, I want 100% to get better and they weren't getting better with the mixtures that we had. So you went ahead, and what, what did you do? Well, I think probably the best case example to give you uh, is a, a, a guy over on your side of the country. I had a dentist in New Jersey contact me. Um, he had developed sensitivity to every kind of dental material, dental appliance material, gloves, dental dams, everything. And, of course, that affected his job greatly. Uh, he couldn't really work on people. Um, and he, can, he also himself needed to wear a partial uh, dental plate because he had a few missing teeth himself. And anytime he tried to put anything in his mouth, no matter what it was made from, he'd have a migraine headache and nasal drainage and debilitating fatigue. Um, so he started doing LDA with a local practitioner in his area, and he was get, he was using the standard chemical mixture and the food mixture, and and, and he was getting partial improvement because he had a lot of other other sensitivities that were covered by those mixtures, but his dental material reactions were still there because they're not represented in the general chemical mixture. Mm -hmm. So. Two or three different people gave him my name um, to talk to, and I've spoken to him on the phone a few times. What I had him do was I told him to put every single kind of, a, a little sample of every sort of dental material he could come up with and put the liquids in a bottle and put the solids in a bag and mail it all to me. So he did. He sent me all this stuff, and I just put little, I put little bits of all of it in a urine cup with some sterile water, and I just sat it there for like two weeks. And every time I looked at it, I would pick it up and shake it. And everybody who came in my office would say, look at it and say, what is that? Because there were teeth in there and things that looked like human gums and stuff. And I said, oh, I'm going to treat this dentist in New Jersey. Um, so after I sat it for a while and I, th I felt like everything had dissolved as much as it was going to, I took a little sample of the water and I made a sterilized dilution from this material. And then I mailed it to him. And he had a very significant response to it because it's all the specific things that he's reactive to. You know, so to me, and, and all we have, I mean, he, he actually had a slight worsening of his symptoms with the first dose, which after I counseled him, you know, he saw as a very positive sign. 
And so successive doses will just be a little bit weaker, and he's, he's getting symptom improvement. Even the first dose after the initial flare, he started to get symptom improvement. And so, he's, you know, he's got a way to eliminate his specific sensitivities because we use the specific materials. And I, I kept that set of vials in my refrigerator, and I just have it labeled dental materials. So the next time I see a patient who got an implant or dentures or something and gets mouth sores from it or whatnot, I've got a mixture that will probably cover it. You know, and I have all kinds of weird stuff in my refrigerator. But, you know, that, that's the kind of thing I call LDI, low-dose immunotherapy. Um, even though it is allergy to a chemical, I, I mostly use LDI to separate it from the antigens that I buy from the pharmacy. So, you know, again, I, I use LDI as an all-encompassing sort of term. Um, but that's, that's sort of a good example of specific chemical sensitivity and what you, can, what you can do with it. Well, it looks as though, and it probably is a great way to lay the groundwork for our next show, that the Thai Vincent approach was if you couldn't get it commercially brought to you, you went and made it some way, some shape, somehow. And the, when you found the antigen, the key is the antigen. When you get the right antigen, you got the trigger and you got the winner. And you did the work and the due diligence as many different avenues of pursuit as it took to find the antigen. And that's the fascinating story of what we'll call Chapter 2, do you want to lay the groundwork for our next show talking about, you call them autologous antigens and these customized antigens for autoimmune disease? Just laying some groundwork. We've got a few minutes left for our next show. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the excitement comes in, honestly. And, and that's where, for the practitioner, for all the clinicians out there, you use all of your skill set and your detective work and your knowledge base. You try to figure out what is triggering these illness symptoms for your patient. So many patients come in and they have widespread inflammatory response problems. All you've got to figure out is either where the antigen trigger must be living, like in their bowel or in their sinuses or something, because you can get those samples, or if you can figure out a specific organism trigger for a condition, which we'll talk about some examples next time, you can obtain that sample and you can desensitize people with it. It's extremely exciting. It, it, sometimes you can do a research review in the medical literature and find out what the molecular mimicry bacteria are for a given autoimmune disease and then use that organism. And we have examples of that. Otherwise, if somebody has an inflamed bowel, you just take a sample of their own stool and make a dilution out of it, and you can desensitize them to that. And you don't even know what it is that you're using, but it works. It works like magic. This is the time, Vincent, approach, the LDI uh, that encompasses so many diseases, Ty, that people are suffering from having no, and I mean nowhere to turn. I'm saying to them now, there's a ray of sunshine coming through that window with using LDI, either coming up with antigens that you get from the patient or mixtures of various organisms, and this does lay the groundwork for our next show. I, I think, um, and just for a moment, I want you to take it as we're, as we're going on out of here. Um, you came up and blew us away in Albuquerque with your work on Lyme's disease, and if I remember correctly, in the last six months, You've had 40 Lyme's patients, if I'm wrong by the number, please tell me, and you've had 38 wins. Am I right about hearing that? Oh, we've, we've got closer to 80 patients now. Um, I get, in fact, I'm, I'm speaking to patients with Lyme disease by phone and by Skype all over the country every week now and starting to send treatment doses to them and getting, getting great responses. Uh, we stopped tracking our actual numbers, but it's, I say we have easily a 95% response rate. To Lyme's disease. Yeah, it's huge. It, it's I mean, huge. we could talk about Lyme disease for two hours alone. It's, what, we've done, what I've done with it from an immune therapy approach, it represents a total paradigm shift in the way we look at this disease and the way we should be treating it. Well, I think that, uh, that I want my listeners to be around for part two of the Ty Vincent uh, discussions because uh, we're moving into this arena where 
nobody else has gone before, and your wind to hear now the number's up to 80. Hey, that was only four weeks ago, Ty. What have you been doing? Um, four yeah. weeks ago, you said the number was 40. Now it's in the 80s, and you got 95% correction rates. So I want to use the word correction for disease that people are suffering from for 15, 20, and 30 years. These are the Ty Vincent LDI successes, and um, to be able to bring these kinds of treatments locally, um, I'm fascinated with your work. I'm one of your now new disciples, and I look forward to our next meeting. Any closing statements you want to make as we wrap it up for today? Uh, I think just that I want your your listeners who are patients to maintain a sense of hope, even if nobody's figured out what to do for them so far, but it doesn't mean they won't. And, you know, the patients that I see do the best are the ones with the best attitude, and, and they believe that something out there is going to work eventually. I know it's hard to maintain that attitude, but it's, it's helpful all the way around. And, you know, with, in my own career, I've repeatedly come up with things that have worked for diseases that, pre- that had no known cure in the past. It's just a matter of time, in my experience. Well, with that ray of hope and that uh, message of hope to listeners that are out there so malingering and so ill for so long, um, we're going to bring you on back. I know you've consented to do it, and um, I don't even think we can cover it in the next show. We may have to go for a few more after that. But I want to thank you today for coming aboard and really uh, sharing with us your development, your enrichment, and how you've taken a therapy that was really intriguing enough, but you've made it uh, uh, a, 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 a wonderment that's going to help a lot of doctors and a lot of patients do much better in the future. Ty, thanks for coming aboard with us today. I look forward to seeing you very soon for part two of this. Um, I can't thank you enough. Goodbye, my friend. Thank you. Be back. 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 Thank you. Thank you.